So uh, I'm Vito Thrine from Piedmont Heart Institute Cardiac Surgeon and joined by Suzanne Barron. How are you? I'm good. Great. And so we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with the first um, session. I, I've been looking, Paul, I've been looking forward to this so much. This is just, uh, this is going to be really exciting. So uh, Mark uh, is going to start off first with an ultimate uh, mitral case of cleft clipping. All right, Mark, show us what you can do. All right. Don't get too excited now because it's just me. So uh, here we go. Good. Everybody can hear me okay? You know, Paul, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this, I think, the best interventional conference around for several years running now. So thank you, and thanks to the moderators and panelists here. So here are some disclosures. So the background of the patient I'd like to present to you uh, is here. Uh, uh, is, uh, you know, we, we count, encounter these cleft-like indentations pretty commonly, and they're really of no great concern to the tear operator, at least in my view. But true clefts, true mitral clefts are, uh, are certainly not common. Uh, you hear about and see on occasion congenital AML clefts and some PML clefts, and these certainly may hinder the ability to achieve a good result with uh, mitral tear. And some st strategies have been used and uh, uh, written about to work around the cleft. Uh, maybe put a device on either side of the cleft uh, in a parallel fashion or sometimes in a V configuration. But here and I wanted to uh, show an alternate strategy of mitral tear for somebody with bileaflet prolapse with PML cleft. She's a 59-year-old with Marfan syndrome. She's status post mechanical AVR and ascending root repair uh, for extensive type A dissection in 2013. She had a descending repair in 2015. She's got heart failure with an EF of 40, and she's been followed for this severe MR for some time. She presented uh, to us following hospitalizations with really failure to thrive, very severe dyspneal exertion, and very refractory to medical therapy. And so here's her TEE. We can see this myxomatous degenerative uh, valve with bileaf, predominantly PML prolapse, uh, dilated LV with an EF of 40. There are large medial and central jets, as you can see here in this bicom view, with severe holostolic MR. And then it looks like there's adequate leaflet tissue in the grasping zones, uh, zone we look at this outflow view. Mitral valve area is generous, nice, at transcephal height, maybe a little on the low side, but uh, nothing to scare us away. And so we sort of felt like this future interventional cardiologist. Pick me, please. I'll do this one. I don't know why everybody else is turning her down. But uh, this 3D view uh, raises some concerns. So you can all see that cleft there. And it certainly seems that it extends down to the annulus. So we're worried about this being more than just a cleft-like indentation. And 3D color suggests that it was indeed a true cleft between the P1, P2 scallops of the posterior leaflet. And there was some uh, MR coming through there. So we figured, well, uh, why don't we target the uh, medial and central jets and certainly target the PML prolapse on either side of this cleft. Maybe we'll do it in a parallel fashion or a slight V-shaped uh, configuration, and we'll reassess the color through that area with the hope that it will remain unchanged uh, or maybe improve. And you've, you've heard these things, you know, hope is not a strategy, luck, yeah, 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 fear. I don't know if I buy all this stuff. I think a lot of these things come into play. So I'm not uh, absolute by any of this stuff. But we did choose this strategy. I told you earlier the transeptal height looked a little borderline, but here we thought we were pretty good. I just wanted to show this in case somebody brought it up. We were able to get an XTW device, the medial aspect of the A2, uh, P2 prolapse segment with an easy grasp there. You can see on the right. Uh, this was confirmed on our 3D view. And we had some reduction in MR, but nowhere near what we uh, wanted. So we then took an NTW device on the lateral aspect of A2P2 opposite the cleft. I think you can see that pretty well there on the left panel, uh, where that second device not released uh, on the left-hand side there, on the other side of the cleft. But the MR got worse. It's not a pretty picture on the right. So we uh, decided we should probably reposition this device. We moved a little more lateral, moved a little more medial. We changed arm angles. Uh, none of this did any good. So we decided to invert and retract into the LA, rotated the device 90 degrees, and maneuvered it over this cleft, as you can see on the right. We then advanced down below the valve. You can see this on the left-hand panel. Uh, the arms, obviously, are perpendicular now to the existing clip. You can see that in the fluoro save I have down there as well. And then we grasped this cleft 
uh, as shown on the right. And uh, actually, if you could make that right color panel play, beautiful. Uh, you get a pretty good look at that. Close the clip arms. Go back, please. Thank you. We close those clip arms down. Not fully. I just decided that maybe I should close this thing to just 20 or 30 degrees. Because we're in a funny <laughs> spot. <laughs> So it looked like the cleft was closed on the left-hand view and the right-hand view, which will hopefully play at some point with uh, not a ton of color coming from at least the clip itself. And we also were happy to see that the, uh, the Hemos improved with this second device in place. Uh, we then put an NT now la uh, lateral to the first clip and anteromedial to the second. So in other words, next to the first clip, um, uh, but medial to that cleft clip, and that was an easy grasp as well. Uh, we had some residual MR, but looked pretty okay. The right panel will show some of that, focusing in on that one jet, and we had a gradient of three. Remember, mitral valve area was 8.9. Nice hemos. So probably done, right? I would, I would say so. So we were, we were happy with the hemos. We were f happy enough with the color. Uh, so I left the room. And, uh, and our imagers just decided to make some nice pretty pictures. Uh, you can see the LA and LA views, uh, both on the conventional color and then with the clear view there on the right. Uh, that LV view in particular is a nice uh, view of what we had done. The next day, her TTE looked good. Fortunately, there were still three devices on her mitral valve, and uh, the color didn't look all that bad. Um, we saw her back at one month. She's now at least six or 12 months out and pretty much the same. Functional class two, no hospitalizations, uh, and probably graded two plus and more. So the final thoughts are is that true uh, posterior mitral valve leaflet clefts are pretty rare. Uh, unlike indentations, these patients are often deemed unsuitable for mitral tear due to the concern for worsening MR through that cleft. And this case suggests, I think, that cleft clipping may be an option for these no-option patients. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Who else on the panel has uh, experience doing the cleft clipping? What do you think, Rahul? So I think, I mean, first of all, amazing work. I yeah, just did one incredible. last week. I got a call um, uh, from my colleague, Alan. He's, he'd done a percutaneous mitral balloon valvule plasty and tore the anterior leaflet straight nice. down the middle. And so it was sort of a, an ad hoc um, bailout. The patient did pretty poorly. And like you did, I, I put it one sort of transverse. And it's quite interesting because you've got to switch your thinking. You're now grasping not in the LBOT view, but actually on your Bicon view because everything's obviously orthogonal. Um, I think one of the limiting factors is how much leaflet you have. I, I was amazed that you were able to get that second clip lateral to your yep. first clip because you put your first one sort of transverse as obviously as close to the annulus as possible and then leaving just enough tissue so you don't have an SLDA. So that was really impressive. But you know, you had a big valve there, you don't always have that real estate. And then the gradient, of course, is sometimes prohibitive, but amazing great. work. That's great, Raul Prodi. Phenomenal case. Um, I have not done the transverse clip myself. Um, have done some clips with we clipping, you know, but those are so unpredictable. Sometimes you get surprised and it's just a great result. But on the other hand, you just leave with a lot of MR. So our strategy is to look for TMVR if we see a cleft. So I have to ask, so Vino, you close things all the time in the all OR. All the time. So, so, so is this just, but, but is this just doing end. like what you do in the OR? I mean, help yeah. us understand. I mean, because one thing I have a question about is how close to the annulus do you put the clip? Do you, are you going to sew the clef off? Do you go really annular or do you go more leaflet but if, tip? If you, if you went toward the leaflet tips on this, I don't know that you could have got a third exactly. clip on. Exactly. So, you know, that one was a little more annular. Right. So for me, it's pretty easy. So we'll put the ring in, we'll put everything, put the stitches in, put everything in, and the cleft will be the last thing that we fix. Because a lot of times the clefts are anatomical, and you don't need to do anything. So it is, the cleft for me is the very last thing that I do. So the ring is seated, I've done the P2 resection or P2 knee accords, I've done the A3, P3 commissuroplasty, and then you'll see a leak and you just kind of stare at it, and then if there's a cleft, we'll get a five, I get a 5-0, and I usually put um, uh, one simple stitch at the edge of the leaflet so you don't uh, curl it, and then I'll put another figure of eight to secure it. So usually not more than uh, two or three stitches, but it's the last thing we do um, because you want to make sure that you don't mess up with an, a truly anatomical cleft or anatomical leaflets. Yeah. But this is not the last thing you did. No. 
I so tried that, to make it the last so, thing I So did. anticipating that yeah. this yeah. is going to work, and then the awesome. third clip is going to work is really expert. I mean, yeah, so pretty, we need to find Thanks. a case like that now. That's what I, I, I that whole presentation, I'm like, we got to find a case like that. <laughs> I, I think the, the other thing that obviously we don't have time to discuss was your, your clip size selection, your strategy, right? Like how you decide to take the XTW first, knowing that you might have one, two additional clips. You know, do you take the NTW or another XTW, hoping you pull it all in? And these are all just, you know, the, the, you know, the strategy of clipping that I think uh, is very nuanced and yeah. you obviously made the perfect choice there. Yeah. I was just going to say, this is expert, I mean, beautifully done. Uh, we've all been in the situation where we've pulled clefts apart, yeah. using wishful thinking, as you described in the beginning of the, of the case. Um, and I've used v, v technique. And often I feel like the hemodynamic results are not satisfactory. You end up with a, a higher gradient than you really want to end up with. So anticipating three steps ahead and doing what you did, I think, is, is great. I'll have to consider doing that one day in the future. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, if I can do it, you can do it. Absolutely great. Well, thanks for a great case. Um, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Sharma. Thanks. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, as always, for, uh, for having me. It's great to be here with the esteemed panel. Uh, so I, the, my task was to talk about a Marshall case with electrocautery for success. And my first thought was to show a lampoon, but I thought, well, you know, there's probably going to be a lot of Marshall clips, so I'll stay in the spirit of the, uh, the conversation. So. This is a, um, a use of electrocautery to facilitate mitral clipping. So this is a um, very unfortunate 30-year-old female who had extensive comorbidities, which led to a transcatheter approach for her. She had AML at age seven, complicated um, by a lot of the side effects of her chemotherapy. Most pertinent to this case was that she was uh, on dialysis for end-stage renal disease. She had systemic calciphylaxis, and you'll see why that's relevant shortly. She'd had a number of thromboembolic complications, as you can see there. And medical management was really difficult in the setting of chronic hypotension, worse on a hemodialysis days, and on medications to try and uh, mitigate that. So her relevant cardiac history, she had this chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy, significant symptoms, her ejection fraction improved and worsened, and she had these fluctuating echogenic masses of calcification seen throughout the left side of her heart, and coexistent moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. And so she was seen by our surgeons and presented our multidisciplinary meeting. And the thought was, given her extensive comorbidities and extremely high, if not prohibitive, surgical risk, a percutaneous option would be preferred. So this was a baseline echocardiogram. You can see there a significant calcification of a lot of her mitral apparatus. You can see on the posterior leaflet that mobile echogenic mass, which was likely calcified, and significant uh, mitral regurgitation there in the 3D as well, showing that very gnarly looking mitral valve. She also had a lot of calcification on the cordae and the papillary heads as well. So we elected to go with a transcatheter approach with a mitral clip. I didn't really know how this was going to go. Given all of those calcifications, I elected to use sentinel cerebral protection for the case. Systemically anticoagulated her. And what I didn't appreciate was that the tunnel dialysis catheter that she had placed in there, which was chronic, would be directly in the way of my transeptal puncture. So I tried a number of catheters. My routine is to take the SL1 with a BRK1 needle. I was unable to get around that tunnel dialysis sheath. I used an Agilis catheter. I still couldn't get around it. And in the end, I actually decided, uh, with the help of our IR colleagues, to pull the tunnel dialysis catheter back. But what I didn't appreciate was that it had been there so long that this fibrin sheath had formed around the dialysis catheter. So the dialysis catheter is now back, but there's still a residual fibrin sheath in the way, obstructing me from getting to that septum. And so what I decided to do there was to actually balloon the fibrin sheath um, because I still couldn't get through. You can see here, transeptal attempt. I've got the medium curve agilis. It's still in the way. I can't get any needles through. I can't get any wires through because that fibrin sheath is, sheath is in the way. So I actually put an over-the-wire balloon through that fibrin sheath and ballooned it, uh, again, not knowing what this would yield. This was definitely my first time doing this, and fractured, for lack of a better word, the fibrin sheath uh, to render it sort of um, disrupted. That seemed to work, um, and you can see there's a lot of residual material there, so I was very glad I used cerebral protection. I had no way of knowing whether I would take any of this stuff across to the other side, and just hoped and prayed that that wasn't the case. And at this point, used the agilis, and now I was able to actually abut the septum without the tunnel dialysis catheter or the residual fibrin sheath in the way. Unfortunately, even with a BRK through this, because of her calciphylaxis and that significantly hardened septum, the BRK would not puncture, the BRK would needle would not puncture even with the application of radiofrequency ablation. I did not have the uh, Bayless all-in-one kit at this point in time. 
And so what I elected to do was to take the uh, back end of an Amplat super stiff wire, put it through the Agilis wire, apply electrocautery to that, and very carefully and slowly puncture through that rock hard septum. And so it was only through using electrocautery we applied to the tip of the stiff wire, the back end of the stiff wire that we were able to puncture through. Now remember I've got the stiff end of a straight wire through um, into the left atrium and so I didn't want to really try and exchange directly for a catheter so I used a glide, full French glide catheter, placed that over the stiff wire very carefully advancing into the left atrium. Um, you'll see here it's sort of even the glide catheter had a bit of trouble getting through that thickened step septum uh, despite ballooning and then advanced the glide catheter into the left upper pulmonary vein. <clears throat> we then had to do a balloon septostomy again because of that thick and hardened septum. You can see there very slow gradual inflation as that septum gives. And actually the rest of the procedure was relatively straightforward compared to that. The mitral clip procedure proceeded in the, uh, the usual fashion. Um, we didn't know how the leaflets would react. There's a lot of calcium there. We were very careful to stay shallow and not get caught up in those cords because I didn't like my chances of being able to evert through those and come back out. Grasping was fairly straightforward, particularly compared to the transeptal process. And we got quite a good grasp there with a, uh, a pleasing result in terms of the improvement on color. Gradient was only three. Uh, you can see here post-deployment, the uh, echogenic mass is still attached to the posterior leaflet, managed not to disrupt that with all the maneuvering above and below the valve uh, and mild residual mitral regurgitation. We had this iodrogenic ASD given how stiff and uh, non-compliant that septum was in the context of her significant thromboembolic complications in the past. I elected to close this. Normally I would not do this with the left to right shunt with no evidence of uh, desaturation or a bidirectional shunt, but again, um, sort of on a, on a best guess estimate of her risk, decided to close that. So used a 25 millimeter gore device to close that uh, interatrial septal defect that we'd created. And you can see there that's well sealed off. Uh, the sentinel device captured quite a bit of debris. Um, and so we're glad you used that. And then you can see there the final uh, result in the pre and post comparison there. So it was a complex case for a number of reasons, but I think the most arduous task in this case, and certainly the most time consuming, was that transeptal approach and uh, using electrocautery as well as uh, a, a number of other unconventional approaches, at least for me, to get through that septum to be able to deliver the mitral clip. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful case. So um, to the panel, how many of you are using uh, Bayless versus Brock and Brow? Bayless. Needle. Bayless. Should I leave now? Questions? If you guys have any questions from the audience, just feel free to raise your hand. We can bring a microphone to you. There's one in the back. I can see a microphone standing up. Yeah, question. Do you consider using something like an angiovac Just repeat the question, Paul. Yeah, so the question was, did I consider using something like an angiovac a suction device to, to get rid of that residual fiber material? Um, I did not. Uh, it was probably a reasonable thought, though. Um, I would probably, if I did this case now, I've got the alpha vac. The angiovac, for those that don't know, you have to attach to a perfusion system, it's big cannulas. The alpha vac is much smaller and you can just use hand suction um, to kind of aspirate and that probably would have worked there. So I think that, yep, the Inari catheter as well. So I think that's a good suggestion. Ro, can I just ask you, so tell us a little bit more details about the wire and the electrifying the wire. Because I think for the user, I got to know what worked in your situation. Yeah, so I think, you know, it wasn't an ideal situation. As you know, when you electrify these wires, you lose, because of the coating of the wire, a lot of the transfer of energy, as long as well as the resistance that's related to the length of the wire. And this was an exchange length wire. Um, and so what we tried to do was um, denude a portion of the wire, similar to what you do with a, a basilica or a lampoon. Um, but again, it's an 035 wire. It's not designed to, to be cauterized. And when you pull the wire out, it was actually completely charred at the tip. Um, it, I think it was a combination of the stiffness of the wire with the additional help of the electrocautery applied to the tip that allowed me to get through. Because I was pressing fairly forcefully with the, well, at least within the comfort zone with the BRK1 with the backup of the Agilis, and it was just not even, it was barely tenting. Uh, there was no yield of the septum. So it's not a jacketed wire? Right? No. This is just a standard 035 wire? Correct. You just, you just scraped the end? Yeah. Because, you know, there are obviously advantages to using the Estado, too. Did you yeah. think about uh, that with the solid core? I tried the Estado. Oh, you lived that Didn't out. budge. Oh, that's interesting. So the Estado, yeah. wow. Did not so budge. Did you okay. use the Estado with the BRK needle? Uh, yes, I did. You yeah, did? That was the first step. So I went BRK through the Agilis, Estado through BRK. It just would not budge. I mean, yes. I, I couldn't even get a tent on that septum. It was like mm. sheetrock. 
That's phenomenal, Rahul. I don't think I'll have the courage to take the back end of Super Stiff and put it in the LA. <laughs> I don't know if it was That's garbage. why this and that to electrify it. Yeah. yeah. This, it will come out of the chest the ultimate, if you push. This yeah. is why it's in the ultimate mitral cases. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That we had a, we know, you'll remember this, we had this mitral PVL that was referred to us, yeah. which was turned down from two different institutions for not being able to cross the septum. And we were able to use uh, Bayless for that. And that septum was almost similar to this, very, very thick. You would not see any tenting whatsoever, but the Bayless kind of helps. Electrosurgery is needed. All right, Pradeep, let's uh, come on up and let's, uh, have a transcatheter replacement for the case number three. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for inviting. Fascinating meeting. Um, last year, I think it was virtual, and we showed the lampoon at that time, so I was thinking, what should we show this time? So here's a 67-year-old male with NYHA3, uh, destiny on exertion, heart failure, a dialysis patient. Uh, that's one of the issues enrolling into a study. Had a peripheral arterial disease with aorta bifemoral bypass, and that was also repaired, so a lot of scar tissue in the groins to keep something in mind. So this is his uh, transesophageal echo, uh, three to four plus MR, and right where the MR is coming, the posterior leaflets uh, calcified, so not really suitable for tear. So that led to TMVR discussion um, in our heart team meeting, and these are the options we have at our center for TMVRs. And as you know, M3, Intrepid, and Tendine are uh, being studied as part of the pivotal trials, and all three will exclude a dialysis patient. The Cephia and High Life are currently in EFS in the US, and both allow dialysis patients. So those were our two options. And we, based on the CT scan, we chose uh, Cephia for this case. This is just a virtual valve implantation in the CT, showing the annulus was in the range for Cephia nice big LVOT, and we thought this would be a good case. So Cephia, as you know, is a um, self-expanding uh, nitinol frame. It's an hourglass shape that has a ventricular disc with these tines that anchors into the anterior leaflet. The waist sits at the annulus and then has an atrial disc. Um, inner frame is the 27 millimeter valve that houses a bovine pericardial tissue trileaflet valve. This is just a schematic, transeptal axis, uh, navigated down to the ventricle. Once you're in alignment, open the ventricular disc and then open the atrial disc. This case was done in the hybrid OR. It's a 35 French sheath as of now, so a surgical cut down. This is Venu cutting down on the femoral vein and as I mentioned, was an aortobifem bypass that was also reduced, a lot of scarring tissue, so a lot of careful dissection there, and then stitches on the femoral vein. Uh, access with a regular needle wire through this, and on the echo you can see we're measuring just the transeptal height. For this device, you want at least four centimeters transeptal height. You want to be superior uh, in the fossa, and just balloon with a 10 millimeter uh, septostomy balloon. After that, this 35 French sheath was inserted. We had the femoral cut down. This is a dedicated sheath that comes with the device over a safari wire. And here is the heavy lifting. The stand comes in. Um, Looks like a motor for an engine, doesn't it? It's massive. It's very heavy. That's why Venus. Uh, I told him I wasn't going to lift it. that anymore. That's just yeah. too damn heavy for me. So you let the engineers lift that, and you bring it in, and this is right in the right atrium across the septum. And as you can see on the hands, there is a, a blue guide box, which is very similar to the MitroClip guide box, as an M knob, exactly same like a MitroClip. So as you're advancing, you're turning the M knob. And uh, on the TEE, you see that we're a little bit anterior. So the same maneuvers as you would use in the mitral clip, just turning the guide box away from you will take you a little more posterior and in the center of the valve. Right there, you see. And then we'll just advance it a little more, turning M knob. Relatively easy to navigate. You don't have to watch too much of the back wall of the atrium like some of the other devices. 
The pre-shaped wire is a dedicated wire that comes uh, from Abbott. After this, you're just checking your trajectory in usual uh, microclip views, basically LVOT view or your intercom view. You're just looking anterior, posterior, medial, lateral, and then do a V-gram just to understand the annulus positioning and the size of the valve. Once you're happy with the trajectory, you start opening the ventricular edges and the tines by counterclocking the red knob. Once you open the ventricular edges, the tines are out. You measure the depth from the annulus, which you can uh, notice on the TEE you're measuring. These are pre-specified numbers that the company gives you. You want to be high. This device does not have um, ability, at least as of now, to lift up in the atrium. You can extend it, if you were too high, you can extend it down into the ventricle, but if you were too deep, then it becomes a problem. So that's why the transeptal becomes super important to stay high. So once in the appropriate depth, you can uh, keep opening the valve. This is the final release of the valve. Keep opening, that opens the the middle portion, and then you advance that white puck that will open the atrial size, atrial side of the disc. And I didn't show you the time on that fluoro screen. When we were crossing the septum, it was 10.55, and you can see it's 11.28. So about 30 minutes from transeptal crossing to really full deployment of the valve. And of the 30 minutes, the first 20, 25 minutes were spent just fine tuning the trajectory. Once you're happy with the trajectory and depth, it's just simple opening of the valve. Valve's fully deployed. There was no pacing, no hemodynamic uh, uh, collapse or anything like that. No balloon pump needed. Once the valve's fully deployed, you take the wire back into the guide sheet and get the nose cone back. Nose cone's pulled back. This is just the short axis. This is a one-month CT scan. This was the first case in the US as part of the EFS study. The patient continues to do well. So transeptal access with Cephia valve, simple control delivery, very intuitive. It's, Abbott did a smart thing by using a lot of the microclip learnings and making the procedure very microclip type, so it feels very intuitive. Stable hemodynamics during deployment and the EFS is currently undergoing, that is enrolling patients with three plus or more mitral regurgitation as up to 30 patients at 10 global sites. And we are very happy to be part of uh, the study. Thank you. So maybe I'll ask Raul this question. So, you know, when we look at um, transapical, transeptal, of course transapical will come out first. Do you think it'll become like the TAVR where in five years from now, you think we'll be still struggling on the transeptal part, or is this really what people need to concentrate on? I think this is what people need to concentrate on. You know, we talk about tendine and, and the transapical approach, and now Intrepid's gone transeptal. I think there's so many, as it is with TMVR, we're already dealing with a lot of anatomical exclusions for these patients, and adding yet another um, element of exclusion in terms of the apex, aneurysmal ap apices, where you don't have a good trajectory from the apex, uh, patients who have a dilated, um, impaired left ventricular systolic function, not to mention the surgical approach and the recovery. I think for that reason, going transeptal and focusing on that is, is the future. I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I think that is what Taver showed us, right? They, from a transapical approach, there really was no, you know, there's no real quality of life benefit over surgery. There was no cost benefit over surgery. And so I do think the future is finding a transeptal way for, for the mitral things. Great. great. Thanks, Pretty. That's great. So next up, we're going to have Dr. Andrew Rossi talk to us about paravalvular challenges. Great, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for the invitation again. Um, I tried to get inside Paul's head and wonder what he wanted me to speak about when he wanted me to talk about mitral power valvular challenges. So I thought first about a case where I put in uh, two mitra clips and I had a big central leak and we ended up having to plug that with, a, with an AVP and I realized that's not paravalvular necessarily, but I learned that from you from this conference actually. I tried to imitate what you did. Um, and then I had a case coming up and I was holding out on putting my slides together because I said, 
I'm doing a mitral valve and ring. I'm definitely going to have a paravalvular leak, and it'll be kind of fun to plug that one. Um, and then we ended up with no leak. So then I was kind of stuck going back to the library, and I decided it was time to uh, just pick an oldie but a goodie, just a standard mitral paravalvular leak repair. Um, so this is a 69-year-old gentleman who basically presented with progressive dyspnea on exertion and eventually heart failure symptoms leading to admission for a decompensated heart failure. His history is of rheumatic heart disease. He had mechanical AVR about 15 years prior with a two-vessel bypass. And then he had a subsequent reduced sternotomy for a mechanical mitral valve replacement. But he never did well post-op. He never returned to his previous functional status. He continued to be short of breath. He did not have endocarditis. And his echo was visually challenging, as you could imagine, with two, mechan two mechanical valves with lots of shielding, but it was suggestive of MR. So obviously, um, we did a TEE, which helped to clarify. So this is the transesophageal echocardiogram, and you see a giant jet just coming from the medial side of the St. Jude mechanical valve. I can't really ignore that. I thought he had to have had endocarditis, right? Negative blood cultures, negative ESR, CRP, all in normal level. He was having a little bit of low-level hemolysis, but um, didn't appear to be transfusion dependent. Um, and he was clearly in heart failure, so we decided we should do something about it. So these are intraprocedural images, um, just laying out the defect a little bit more. It's a posterior medial defect. Um, and as we know, the medial defects tend to pose challenges just from a coaxiality perspective. So we did a standard transeptal puncture. In this case, because it was posterior and medial, um, we went a little bit higher so that we could angle down and get to the medial defect, and we started off a little central to anterior on the transeptal fossa puncture. And this is us just exchanging out in the left upper pulmonary vein. This is baseline V-wave up to the 50 range, 50 to 55, so clearly significant mitral regurgitation. Um, we went ahead and crossed using an Agilis catheter, which I think has sort of become the standard way to cross these leaks now. We have a multi-purpose diagnostic catheter with an angled glide wire, 035. Once we got across the defect, we exchanged out with the multi-purpose catheter for a stiff wire in the LV apex. I like to do balloon sizing in these cases. I know a lot of people are worried about dehissing. There was no evidence of endocarditis. There was nothing to suggest the valve was rocking. And I honestly feel that we often underappreciate the size of these defects, so we went ahead with an ASD sizing balloon. Um, we got a 12 millimeter measurement in the short axis, and then what we could tell by a TEE was that it was really a very long crescent-shaped defect. And ultimately our strategy was going to be that we are going to need more than one device and likely have two devices side by side. Um, I'm a firm believer in having multiple wires in because the last thing you ever want to do is cross a defect again after you put a plug in. So I always, if I was planning two, two plugs, I put a third wire in. And then you see us delivering our ansel sheaths via transeptal puncture, two sheaths across the mitral valve defect. And even with the two sheets in, these are six and seven French ansels, there's still a significant amount of leak around the device, which to me speaks to the size of the defect and tells you you really need to put some large devices in. So we have two AVP 16 millimeter devices, AVP2. Um, sorry, I, I should have put that. Yeah, these are not fours. These are AVP2 devices, um, and we use two 16 millimeter devices. On the left screen, you see that we're opening up the ventricular discs, and then on the right screen, Notice we'll bring the first disc back, approximate it at the mitral annulus, and then we'll start to bring the second disc back. They almost kind of sit on top of each other. Um, and then on the left screen, this is before release. I don't know about you guys, I get very nervous these things are going to embolize, so I really give a nice solid tug before I release, and then on the right screen is the final position after we do release. Um, they look, you know, they look pretty good. Um, these things often do, and I'm, of, I'm often disappointed that there's going to be more leak even after the devices go. Um, but in this case, we were pretty satisfied with the result. Um, the left screen shows you the devices in motion. I think it should click here in a second. On the right side of the screen, you see without color, a device is well seated, not rocking, no motion. And on, on the bottom right side, there is some residual MR coming um, from central. Um, you've got physiologic jets, and then you also have a little paravalvular leak adjacent. But on transthoracic and follow-up, we were quite pleased with this. And the thing for me was, I always like the pictures that our imagers give us, so I try to show them off a little bit. Um, but really not much leak on the left screen when you show color there. And then um, the hemodynamic result was very favorable. Um, patient has done incredibly well. This is the, if you look on the, the pictures up on the top, 
the pre-image just to remind you what it looked like at baseline with the giant V wave. And then on the right side of the screen, a much improved paravalvular leak with significantly improved hemodynamics. So um, he did very well clinically. His one month echo post, uh, post procedure basically shows almost no residual leak. Interestingly, his hemolysis got better, which I don't often expect to be the case for these patients, but he had a very low level, so probably wasn't his major, his major problem. And then if I could just impart some, you know, some points that I would recommend is obviously this procedure is completely dictated by your imager as are basically every other structural procedure. So find a great one. Uh, the transept transeptal location will dictate the entire course of the procedure. And in this case, everything was smooth for delivery because we anticipated the trajectory that we were going to need. Um, I like to have multiple wires up front, so I'm not kicking myself and wishing I had, had done that earlier. And then just be aware of all the devices that are out there. Obviously, there are some that are available in the US and some that are not. Um, and I like to deploy multiple devices at the same time because I feel that there's a chance of interacting with a second or with the first device that was deployed if I'm then positioning a second or a third device afterwards. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That was uh, nice. So uh, that, I was going to ask you about that. So you put in what, a 20 French sheath or? So we had a 20 gore dry seal. Yeah. Um, love using the dry seal for yeah. getting multiple sheets in yeah, for the venous great. access. Yeah. So does everybody do that or do yeah. uh, you do sequential? I always use a dry seal and I always take a 20. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Big, and, big and venous sheet. both at the same time. Yeah, big venous sheet. Do you always balloon size these? Yeah. Because I typically do. That was do. Be my question. What was the balloon big, size? Yeah, balloon size PVLs. We'll just put double wire and just put the largest plug you can fit in and if there's still leak put one more or two well, more why, why not ct size it uh, ahead of time a little bit more you know and, and we, get a better sense yeah. of that especially we, in this one where you have so much shadowing from the uh from the echo and the two my uh, two mechanical valves I, so i was, I, so I was yeah. going to say we um we often don't balloon size in this case they're mechanical valves so we had a lot of shadowing oftentimes we can really rely on 3d te to really kind of get us dimensions but because of the shadowing, we just wanted to be sure we weren't missing something your transeptal and the trajectory was really, I mean, you went up and then came back down. So what, what was the delivery catheter did you, did you use? Did you, did you use a flexor or what, what was it? So after the transeptal, we switched out to the Agilis and then we gave a really tight curve, uh -huh. rotated it as immediately as possible and then just delivered. And then we used Ansel sheets, just regular Ansel, like oh. Ansel 1. Yeah. And, and for the wires, for the extra stiff wires? They were extra stiff. Okay. Yeah. How many people here externalize their wire? I, I do it like you do. I don't externalize and create a rail, but does ever, anyone here routinely so create I was a rail? Gonna, I, was, I was actually half hoping that you were going to create a rail here because, because the double mechanicals always issue is you know, impingement. But I've done it with double mechanicals, and you just have to let the wire loose when you're, you don't need to. But that's why I was asking what delivery catheter you put across, because sometimes you really need that rail to pull across, especially your trajectory, that transeptal, and how you came up and down. I, I mean, I'm impressed that you're able to pass the, the sheets integrate without without a rail. I well, think in our case, rail having the, I think having the extra buddy wire helped actually. So having three wires across probably made it a little easier. To get we've through. had very good luck with putting safaris in. I default safari and just don't have to externalize at all. In fact, we knew. Does this remind you of yesterday? Oh, don't, so, no, I'm, I'm, uh, don't, don't, don't do PTSD I'm gonna, on me right now, full dude. Details, I mean, but we put two AVP 20 millimeter uh, plugs, oh, AVP 2s, two 20s after a certain TMBR in the medial commissure. And as everything looked good, mild MR, once you release it, the vertically standing AVP felt horizontal into the valve orifice. Yeah. And it occluded the, the valve occluded on the, the valve. atrial side. So then we had to snare both of those out and then put an ESD occluder. That's, that's for next year's case. Yeah. <laughs> the one other thing I would comment on, I was really nice, it was really nice for you to see that the two sides of the AVP2 were on the LA. And so, so that's another expert maneuver, you know, to put those two on the LA side, not on the LV side, where they could leaflet and pinch. Right. Yeah, that was really great. All right, uh, should we move? Yeah, Did last, you just Mark, last quick, one. Yeah. Troubleshooting, if you couldn't externalize through that mechanical valve, would you have externalized through the apex of the four French? 
I've it's, done that once, and it it's seems something to be I did low. in training yeah. Um, yeah. with Igor Palacios, who stuck the apex blindly all the right. time. Right. Amazingly, I don't know how he never got yeah. into trouble, but I've never done it you know, on my own at it, this point. It actually yeah. works pretty it works well, fantastic. to be honest. And, and, and you, you just use a four French, four French, a four French micro. You can even use a micro catheter, right? Uh, four French, and I mean, you just snare a glide, right. and that honestly gives you all the support. And you don't need to close the apex. No, you don't need to close. Yeah, just just main main thing is when you stick it. Don't use a. They're all redos. Yeah, don't do that on a version. Yeah, chest. but just just yeah. make sure you don't use a core needle, because if you use a core needle, you core out the bobsy, then you will have bleeding. Yeah. So let's have a style at. All right, let's. Uh, that's awesome. Great, uh, Paul. Let's uh, something for you to talk about an edge. I don't know that you've done these, so maybe it's your. Uh, maybe you had to dig through the archives for an edge to edge. Uh, I feel like mine is going to be like kind of like easy compared to all those <laughs> other ones. So, but I'll, I'll just show you this. So this is interesting. So. All right, you can probably guess what I'm going to show you just from the first slide. It's a 58-year-old man, inferior STEMI. Uh, he got treated elsewhere, uh, got his uh, uh, juggling stents to the right, and he was doing great. And then he developed some instability, so they placed a balloon pump and said, he's in pulmonary edema, can you take him? And he said, sure. So he, uh, he came and, you know, typical infarct type pattern, and, and he was doing okay. Uh, but, you know, we decided to look a little bit further. So. All right, what do you guys think? Pretty. I think the issue here is you can clip it, but this thing gets wrapped in the shaft of clip and becomes an issue. Okay, Andrew? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, thank you, no, I totally agree, and I, I wonder how much of that is leaflet, how much of that is flail cord, how much of that is papillary muscle, so, I think there's probably some muscle component there. I'm a little worried about clipping it. I agree with you. I think that's definitely going to be some path muscle that's, that's, that's involved there. Show us what you did. Yeah? Okay. Well, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a huge path muscle, and the, the MR is just torrential. I mean, it was, just, it was just, I don't think there was any really serious forward flow here. Um, so it was... Uh, we did mitral clip, and uh, you can see there. Uh, so it was a posterior medial pap muscle rupture, and so we went in, uh, took an XT, uh, it was an XTW, and you can see there, um, I, it wasn't great. I mean, the leaf insertion, I'm, you know, it just, it just wasn't great. And, and Paul, can I ask you, your, your surgeon's like, we don't want to operate him, he just had a couple of stents. Right? Yeah, he just had a couple of stents, and this is in the middle of the night. It was actually, I think, Christmas Eve. And no one wanted to come to the hospital, so they called me. And I wasn't even on, I wasn't even on call. I was just at home. <laughs> Paul, one of the issues with these is these are so such different planes, such different heights. So do exactly. you ever catch the posterior first and then drive down? So that was the big problem here. So you look at this grass. This is not a grass that I don't think any of us would be happy with. And it's because, you know, when we think about, you know, like a Barlow's valve with a tall gap height, we struggle with getting the arms on the on the LV side and the clips or the grippers on the LA side, but this, this gap height was extraordinary because, because this is like a weighted weight that was just simply billing up and down. And so I had a really hard time staying on the LV side and getting the grippers to fall in LA. This is the only grass I could get. And did you go for the pathology or did you think, let me start a little? In a honestly, I, I tried, I honestly started for the pathology, like the top left. And then actually, I actually let this go, and I thought, well, maybe I'll just try a zip. Yeah. Zip was hopeless. Really? It, it just didn't work. Because wherever I grabbed, next to it, the gap height didn't change because the papillary muscle was just taking everything into the left atrium. Paul, we had a late SLD once that we ended up having to treat on a subsequent procedure. We ended up snaring the first device to stabilize it. Mm. Um, and sometimes, I don't, I don't know about snaring a pap muscle and how feasible that is, but <laughs> I don't know, maybe it provide a little bit of stability. Wow. <laughs> uh, the surgeon's laughing, <laughs> snaring a pap muscle. It sounds like fun, though. I mean, you know, that's the thing about structural, right? We love snaring. You have to admit, anything, give me a snare, I'll, 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 I'll be there. So it, it wasn't great. And so I went back in and just kept trying, just working and working and working. And I actually thought about adenosine, but I was worried that I would kill him with adenosine, honestly. And I, I use it, many of you probably know, I use adenosine liberally in my clip cases. I really love getting those gaps to come down and leave it's a fall. But eventually we got it in. And you know, it was actually okay. 
And so when I, I've done a few of these now, and what I try to do is I try to trap the pap muscle close to where it came from. In other words, on the LV side. But this was so hard that essentially I just took whatever I could get. And so this, this pap muscle ended up on the LA side. And here's the MR. I mean, it just wasn't great. You know, and so, so uh, honestly, it was a bit frustrating. And so, uh, so I thought, well, I got pretty good insertion. So maybe I can work with this. Maybe I can uh, try to get things a little bit better by going more medial with the next grass. Um, and this is how it looked. And so here, this is one of the challenges is that, see that pat muscle? It's, it's on the LA side. So that means that whatever leaflets is attached to is also on the LA side, which basically means that the MR reduction is not going to be as pristine as one would want. And so in the top right, you can see there's still a lot of MR. And the bottom right, you can see there's actually also not a whole lot of space to go medial. And so, but I was prepared to, because I was like, you know what? We gotta, we'll, we'll put this in, we'll, we're gonna keep trying. Um, but I had serious concerns about the pat muscle being on the LA side and that everything being up there where I couldn't grab. So then I, I swapped things out and then look, so, are we done? Yeah, we're done. <laughs> so so I, I was like, okay, that's good. You know, and because honestly, and I, I didn't put this in here, uh, but I can just describe to you, when we look medial, there was nothing to grab. There, all, all, everything was up in the LA. There was nothing to put back together. And I said, LA pressure 15. So, Paul, yeah. when you made that assessment, did you say there was a balloon pump in? No. Oh, yeah, there is a balloon pump in. So did you turn the balloon pump down when you assessed? Yeah, actually, we did. So this and is it was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Because yeah. the LVs actually looks hyperdynamic. You know, for someone yeah. that's had a very muscle rupture and that's right. a big infarct, I, I was surprised. Yeah. The walls are moving. Yeah, all the walls yeah. seem did you, did you think about putting some other type of device there? Yeah, so I thought about an ASO or, or AVP2. But, you know, I thought, look, he's going to have surgery in a week or so. Uh, or two weeks off his plavix, you know, in LA pressure 15, he's going he's gonna to live. And that's exactly what happened. So, so about a week later, he went to surgery, got his valve replaced, and, and he did well. But I, I wanted to show that, and I want to show you another example. And so this is what I was trying to get to. And so, uh, so on the bottom left, or the left-hand side, you can see, see the pat muscle trapped on the LV side? And this is where I, I get at, you know, you hear me, you hear me on my bandwagon about transcatheter coaptation reserve, not tear. You know, we're trying to restore the coaptation. So if you put the papillary muscle close to where it was originally, the coaptation gets closer. And this MR was pretty mild. And this patient did well with no surgery. And so, so I think that's the take home here is that I think if we do these, we gotta try to get things closer to where they were before they ruptured and the result will be better. But, so what's your tip to try and do that? What are some tips and tricks to, because. So you know. if they're stable enough, give adenosine and get it to fall down and get the grippers on the LA side. And, and if we can do that, it works really. I mean, look at this guy's heart rate. It's much different from that last case. Do, do you yeah. think reducing the tidal volumes, which I do quite a lot now? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't case. do that, but that, that would be a, a, a good thing to do. Because most of the time, yeah. the anesthesiologist keeps them at like 450, 500. Yeah. I'll often drop to 350, 300. We, we can eventually grab at 200, but even doing apnea would, would be reasonable. So, so take home points here um, you know, for transcatheter repair of acute papillary muscle rupture. The gap height is what you have to manage. You know, that it's, it's, it's the most extreme of the gap heights that we will treat. I found in a handful of cases that I've done, I mean, I'm not an expert in terms of the number of cases by any means, but I found that trapping the palpin muscle on the LV side is what we try to shoot for. The third thing I would tell you is that perfection is not necessary. These patients almost always are a bridge to surgery, and that's perfectly fine. And then in this case, it's actually interesting. The LA pressure really helped me. Uh, the MR was still s severe, but the LA pressure was fine, and I knew he would do well, and he did. So, thank you very much. It was a great case. Um, we'll next be hearing from Dr. Vijay Iyer uh, about treatment of extreme mitral pathology. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul, for the invitation. Uh, this is my first time here. Great meeting. 
Uh, it's not often that you check in and you get a handwritten note from the organizer, so thank you for that. Appreciate it. Uh, this is going to look pretty mundane compared to what everybody's been presenting, so uh, we'll walk our way through it. So this is a case of a 79-year-old woman that we had originally seen for a transcatheter aortic valve replacement about four years before this next procedure. Uh, at that time, even then, her SCS score was pretty high for a single aortic valve replacement. Uh, you can see multiple comorbidities. Uh, at that time, she had a mean gradient of about 11, and a valve area that calculated out to 2. So based upon the fact that she had no other options, we proceeded with the transcatheter aortic valve replacement. She had a 26 millimeter Edwards S3 valve. Uh, over the last uh, four years, she's done reasonably well. Not great, but uh, reasonably well. But over the last six months, she went on to be uh, class 4 heart failure. Uh, seen again by our surgical team, felt to be prohibitive risk for surgery, so we decided to look at options. So uh, as is our usual strategy, we always look for trials for these patients because these are, um, that I, I personally believe that most of this off-label stuff, especially since our results are not so great, it's probably best to enroll them in a trial. Uh, the two trials that we have available, Summit and Circle, uh, we try to screen them for both. And on both of them, as Vino said earlier in the previous session, the screen failure rates in these trials are enormous. Uh, you know, and well, we're finding that for the tricuspid ones too, but uh, the knee outflow tract was measured at less than 250 with a small LV cavity with a lot of MAC, so Summit was a trial failure, and heavy MAC with Encircle was a trial failure as well, screen fail. So uh, that led us to sort of think about it. Uh, I don't know if you can play that left panel a little bit. Thank you. Uh, so you can see uh, heavy MAC, um, small LV cavity, all of that portends um, potential disaster, as all of you were on this panel now. Uh, but we were sort of running out of options, and we decided uh, based upon our best. So this is a little bit of the CT measurements. You can see um, a lot of MAC. There's a transcatheter valve. A little bit of a septal bulge, but um, unfortunately not a lot of good septal perforator branches that would be good options for an alcohol septal ablation. So sort of had to rule that out as an option for potentially being one option for uh, uh, preventing uh, LVO uh, outflow tract obstruction. Uh, these were the new outflow tract measurements for Tendine versus an S3, so we had about 180. Now, if you go back to the literature from the Detroit group, 180 is probably still doable, but we were still obviously concerned with the small LV cavity. And I think we decided then, based upon that, we'd done a couple of tip-to-base, uh, uh, base-to-tip balloon-assisted lampoons in the last uh, couple of months, so we felt maybe that, make, that gives us the best option for minimizing our chance of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. You can see our plan was to do a balloon expandable TMVR with a 26 S3. We did feel that even with that, our chance of outflow tract obstruction would be reasonably high. So um, we decided that um, the only option, if we did get into trouble, we had unfortunately in our early experience with uh, valve and MAC, we'd had a couple of balloon, a couple of valve embolizations as well. So we decided that uh, we would probably have some surgical standby as well, and surgeons, surprisingly, were willing to attempt it. So we decided to go, go through this procedure. Our plan was to do a base to tip balloon-assisted lampoon with an alcohol septal ablation. If it became a bailout option, uh, try to go after those micro septal perforators that we had and bail out emergency surgery if needed with ECMO on standby. So we actually cannulated the patient. So uh, the procedural step for those of you who do this routinely, this is uh, routine for you guys, but for those who are not, uh, general anesthesia, transesophageal echo, arterial axis, and venous axis on the left leg, we were prepared for ECMO. We'd actually cannulated and ready to place the patient on ECMO if needed. Uh, right IG for a transvenous payfield, right femoral vein for the 24 French go dry seal sheath, which would be used for doing the lampoon procedure as well as for deploying the valve. An 8 French uh, right femoral arterial sheath to create a snare, uh, to create an AV uh, rail. Transceptal axis, I usually put two 8.5 French agile sheets and use the, the, do that, use that for the lampoon, and created an AV rail using a 300 centimeter run through wire in the left ventricle. I think that's pretty standard. Most people do something similar. Uh, we decided to do a base to tip lampoon with a, with, through the, uh, one of the agility sheets using a 6 one GR4 guide and the Estado wire. Um, after multiple attempts, and if you see the previous slide, you saw how much MAC there was, and we just could not get a base perforation that was reliable. It kept deflecting into the cavity. We tried different guide catheters, tried to get underneath the MAC, and we just could not get to the base. Nothing that was reliable, nothing that we felt. It was. So, on the fly, we decided, well, the next best option would be to just do a tip to base, and we were able to do a tip to base, and we'll show you that next. So some of the, some of the paraphernalia that goes on with all of this, you can see a lot of material in here. You have a, 
uh, temp wire in here, you have a rail in here, you have a uh, tulip snare trying, uh, in the, uh, through a uh, JL three and a half guide placed in place. We created the rail, we did do the tip to base uh, lampoon. You can see a good uh, T depiction of that and I'm always amazed by the echocardiographers and how good those images are. And you can see after the tip to base we did create a little bit of a, you can see the uh, laceration and the, uh, uh, on the sort of the, um, uh, probably not absolutely optimal, but probably closer to where we wanted it to be in terms of the laceration. I think fortunately uh, what I have learned is that despite that laceration has, has been shown, the MR never becomes an issue where you're sort of running to uh, stabilize these patients. They were just pretty stable through the whole thing. Uh, the rest of the TMVR is pretty standard. You can see the amount of calcium. Um, and obviously um, it doesn't matter how many times you've done this. To me a Valvin Mac is still uh, kind of scary. Uh, <laughs> till the, after you've deployed it, you're still worried about valve embolization, you're worried about outflow tract obstruction, you don't know the patient's going to crump on you. So uh, a little bit scary, you can see uh, uh, balloon uh, deployment. Uh, can we play the right side? So fortunately, deployment looks great, very stable. Uh, I added an extra CC of deployment just to be sure. What size valve? 26. Uh, we played around a little bit with 23 and 26 in terms of sizing. I just didn't feel comfortable with a 23 over expanded. A 29 would not be, would clear, definitely give us outflow track obstruction. Our skirt outflow track with a 29 would have been close to 70, so that was not even an option. So 26, great result. I did not see any PVL. Uh, so that's the gradient afterwards. I don't know. What do you guys think? Acceptable, not acceptable? 22 and 13. Peak gradient, 22 mean gradient of 13. That's under general anesthesia. Uh, would you take it? Would you live with it or just kind of move on? What was the gradient across the aortic valve prosthesis? So the, the gradient at baseline was uh, already about eight, main gradient of eight. So um, that's the aortic valve gradient or the that's, that's the net gradient across the uh, aortic valve. So that's outflow track that's and valve. So would you give ice, would you give isopro? So we did we did do a couple of challenges on the table. Uh, we kind of did tank up the patient. You know, one of the things you always worry at the end of anesthesia is you can see LB cavity is small. Tank up the ventricle, spend some time, make sure you're actually getting a good gradient before you decide to move away from there. You know, because we'd already cantilevered the ECMO. So our bailout strategy, if we had outflow tract obstruction, was to go to a citral-like approach. We were not, the surgeon was not willing to go in and do a full mitral valve replacement. We were going to go in with a transcatheter valve and sort of do the citral approach where you would take a couple of sutures and deploy it. But, so that's where we left it. So she was extubated post-procedure, discharged day home, uh, day three post-procedure, one month follow-up. She's in NYHA class two status. LV outflow tract gradient at one month is peak of 25, mean of 14. She's no longer oxygen dependent during the daytime. She still uses oxygen at nighttime. So um, I, I, I'd say overall, given the consider, it's, it's a win for us. I mean, I don't know that this is a perfect result, but I think this is sort of what you come to live with and uh, expect for MAC cases. My takeaways for me and, and what I've heard all day today is, to me, MAC is still a challenge clinically, both in terms of what to pick and I think for those centers that have options of you know, some of the EFS studies, this is great, but for those of us who don't, you live with what you have or you try to get them into a trial. Uh, I still find that the procedural outcomes are very uncertain. Uh, it doesn't matter how much planning you do, there's still a level of uncertainty which is a little bit perturbing, uh, especially in terms of having a meaningful conversation with the patient about the risks and the outcomes. Uh, obviously, extensive CD planning and procedure planning is critical. Uh, with that, I'll stop and thank you so much. Take any questions or comments. I think we have time for maybe one question. Any thoughts, Rahul? Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, our approach is if where possible, put them in a study for a TMVR. Um, you went through some of the limitations. And then, of course, we have lethal modification strategies. We've got sesame now. I don't know if anyone's tried that, where you, you know, lacerate and uh, split yeah, open okay. the septum. Um, but, but I sometimes think while you can do it, it's not necessarily a case of should do. Um, for our, at Stanford, we like to do the kind of citral approach. And I think, you know, surgeon gets a very simple right thoracotomy, goes through the groove of Sondergaard and expose the left atrium. And not only can you just place the valve, but they can resect the anterior leaflet. Um, you can often, you know, resect some of that calcification, some of that MAC, get a bigger valve in. So it's not just about the new LVOT, you're actually getting, I think, better hemodynamics. Um, and they do quite well. They recover pretty well from that. So that's been our preference. We've done about 10 or 11 of those now. 
rather than, you know, you, know, you had a lot of hardware in there, it's, you know, obviously not without risk. And as you said, they're still hair raising as you deploy those valves in spite of all the planning that you, you might want to do. That's sort of our approach to where the, the reality is that some patients are not even good candidates for surgical. I mean, I think to put them on pump and try to get them off pump is just not possible. And I think you really, you have to weigh your options, you know, and sometimes it's between picking bad versus worse <laughs> procedures. Um, any, any thoughts on uh, neo LVOT, end systole versus early systole? We're seeing that concept with some of the dedicated TMVRs. You wonder, like, does that hold true for Sapien as well? Yeah, I, you know, it's always it's a moving target. You never know. And, you know, even after you get all your measurements, when you deploy, you're still a little bit uncertain because a millimeter or two difference in where your valve lands makes so much of a difference to what your measurement is going to be eventually. And you can plan as much as we can. We do a lot of 3D printing for these models. We play around with it. We try, you know, we print our 3D patient-specific 3D prints, and we try to play with the calcium levels. We deploy the valves. When we look at 23 expanded with plus 2 or a shell of 26 expanded with one less. And, and at the end of all of this, you still have a level of uncertainty yeah. about what your true skirt near outflow tract is going to be once yeah. you've deployed. Well, do, you, do you know what it was in your case? That's what I was going to ask you. After deployment? No, it no was before. Before? Predicted. Ne uh, predicted was about once 180. Oh, okay. That's so it was really already kind of marginal. We knew that we were going to be marginal. That's, to pre, start. that's pre lampoon, right? Yeah. Was, so the lampoon. That's pre lampoon. Probably, yeah, post so you're lampoon, probably right yeah. around the 250, probably post lampoon. No, that was skirt near LVOT 170, right? So yeah. that is that factoring is that lampoon. That's that right. is that lampoon. Yeah. But also that was end systole, correct? That is correct. So I think the concept is that maybe at mid systole, it may be a little bit. It may be a little bit bigger. Yeah. So you know, we took all of that into consideration before saying no, because many times you walk in and you know you're walking into a disaster, and you say you're not going to do this. Right? I think so, we've pushed on so, a little bit more on this new LVOT, like going smaller and smaller. Like if mid systole looks okay, then uh, we've taken new LVOT even le all all the way to 100. Yeah, but remember seconds. the last one that we did? We ended up doing an alcohol ablation on table for a new LVOT of 250. Right. To right. your point, like how so good you, are we in predicting? So having. Think, and the second part is, you know, with, with base to tip, I feel a lot more comfortable that you're going to get a better lampoon. But I think with tip to base, it's unpredictable with that much MAC because you often don't end, you don't end up close to the annulus. You only end up lacerating the tip of the leaflet. Now we don't so, do uh, tip to base at all, even if it's a ring, straightforward, nice leaflet because you're never sure. Mm -hmm. So our philosophy is always base to tip no matter what. So we've been talking a lot, I've heard it a couple of times today, that the imager is very important. So our next topic is going to be by Thank Lucy uh, Safi, who's going to talk about imaging saved my interventionalist. Come on up, Lucy. They always save us. We say that you guys save us and vice versa, and then they save us too. So. It's a team. It's a team effort. Uh, so good afternoon. I'm Lucy Safi. I'm an uh, interventional echocardiographer at Hackensack in New Jersey. Today, I'll be presenting a case about a sticky situation. So my case is a 61-year-old female who presented with complaints of dyspnea. She has a history of severe mitral regurgitation, underwent a bioprosthetic valve and an annual opacity ring in 2010. Now, she came to us with this history. I don't know why they chose to do a bioprosthetic in a young uh, female at that time, but she did come back four years later with endocarditis, so I suspect that may have had something to do with it. At that time, she had a mechanical mitral valve replacement and uh, other history of hypertension. Um, it's actually paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and non-obstructive coronary disease. On her blood work, she was found to have an anemia with a elevated LDH and a low haptoglobin, suggestive of, hemo of hemolytic anemia. And her echocardiogram is shown here. So this is our TEE on the left. You can see that her mechanical mitral valve leaflets are normally moving, but there is a paravalvular leak. This leak is directed laterally and right into her left atrial appendage. The transmitral gradient across her mitral valve is three. Uh, a normal heart rate, I think it's 53 on the slide. So looking in 3D here at the surgical view with the aorta traditionally placed at 12 and the appendage at 9, you can see that her paravalvular leak originates just lateral, or just adjacent to where her left atrial appendage is. Uh, it's, a, it's a large or elongated uh, leak and it was thought to be secondary to suture disruption. Uh, there was no evidence of endocarditis on this, dehist or this paravalvular leak. 
using QLab, we're able to actually measure the orifice of this leak, and it measured uh, 11 by 4 millimeters in dimension. You can see in the bottom left on, in the blue plane that it's elongated, um, but it was one, one area. It wasn't multiple areas. It wasn't serpiginous. It looked like a pretty straightforward paravalvular leak. So she was presented at our MDT, and they did not want to do a third reduced anatomy on this patient. It was recommended that she have paravalvular leak closure. So we brought her into the lab. And at our institution, we do have echofusion, which we use for these cases. And it's, it's actually incredibly helpful. You know, Dr. Chen spoke earlier about um, imaging, and echofusion does help reduce radiation exposure to the entire team and patient and also reduce uh, procedural time. So here's us building our heart model. It went through pretty quickly, so I'll let it play again and I'll explain it. But basically, we start with a 3D volume set. Once that 3D volume set is acquired, uh, so this is us acquiring the 3D volume set here. Once it's acquired, we get two orthogonal views in fluoroscopy. This entire process takes less than 10 seconds. It's pretty quick once you know what you're doing with it. And then confirmation of the planes are seen here. You can see the atrium is outlined in purple, the ventricle in that um, salmon color. And so we have our anatomical model built on our fluoroscopy. Now we can put our markers, we can um, set our, our fusion to our fluoroscopy as you see here. And so our transeptal uh, puncture site was marked for the uh, interventional fellows. And uh, they're pretty spoiled. They have access to echo fusion, and they find it incredibly helpful in order to help with these transeptal punctures. Here you can see that the catheter is directed right into where the uh, paravalvular leak was on previous imaging. You can see that the aortic valve is at 12 here. And we went ahead to create our rail, so you can see that the wire is in, looped through the left ventricle up, and then being snared now to being externalized. Now this is what the interventionalists see, this is what I see. So on my end, I can see, again, all the catheters and wires looping through the ventricle, and we're watching this happen. And then we see this. We see that the leaflets of the mitral valve start to have this funny motion. And this happened right around the time when they were bringing in the AVP2. So um, at this point, we immediately turned to 2D. And we noticed that as they were bringing in the AMPATS or vascular plug into the left ventricle, they caught that lateral mitral valve leaflet. And so you can see here that it was immobile. Um, thankfully, it wasn't released yet. It was just being brought into the left ventricle, and it was immediately recognized. So we, we let our interventionalist know who further advanced the plug to free it from the leaflet, avoiding any kind of hemodynamic compromise to the patient. The rest of the procedure was essentially uncomplicated. Here you can see that the plug is being pulled back towards that lateral uh, paravalvular leak. And our final images are shown here where there's essentially no residual paravalvular leak. You can see that prior leak that was being directed into the appendage is now gone. There's no change in the transmitral gradient. And on 3D, you can see that plug exactly where that paravalvular leak once was. So take home messages, echofusion imaging is helpful in guiding for paravalvular leak procedures, but when you're crossing through with your catheters and wires, pay close attention so you don't avoid dis or so you don't avoid disruption of the leaflet motion. Thank you. So Lucy, maybe I have a different type of question for you than the case. That was a, a, a very elegant case. It seems like to me that whenever I go to visit sites, there's one person who's doing a lot of the structural cases in intraprocedural. Is there a push to try to have more um, cardiologists do this? Because I, I see that we're doing more and more cases, and for us, we have Manny Vannon. The rest of the guys are kind of interested, but kind of not interested. Um, can you just tell us where that field is going? Are, are we starting to super niche out that field? Now? Is there plans for more training of this type of people, because I think they're going to be really necessary. Yeah, I agree. I think that d dedicated structural heart imagers are, are important in terms of growth for these programs, especially as our, as our procedures become more and more complicated. Um, so it's actually a very hot field right now, um, and a dedicated training like I did at certain institutions is probably recommended when you're doing these advanced structural procedures. 
Yeah, we've seen a real change in the interest level in advanced imaging amongst the fellows. I mean, it's, I, I have no concerns. Everybody <laughs> wants to do this. Yeah, yeah but, but yeah. one person is spending, uh, you know, three hours in a case right. that we just say, had the other day, right? We right. did a very tough case, and Manny stood there for three and a half hours. He got three R views for it. That's his and right. how the hell are, is the right. institution? Now, he, he's unique. He's unlike the other guys where they're not maybe R view based. He has a flat right. salary. But that's not... The personnel that's not will be there, though. Transportable everywhere. I think it's a yeah. big issue for us. Well, but you do need the expertise, and and having four or five people do this uh, is not good either, depending on your volume, of course. But I do think the field, uh, uh, mostly because of you guys and through ASE and stuff like that, this mm -hmm. field is just blowing up huge. Fusion imaging takes up a ton of time. Are you yeah. really yeah. ten seconds? It's really quick. Once you know what you're doing, I mean, there is a learning curve, um, but once you, you know what you're doing, now that's to build the anatomical heart model. That takes about 10 seconds, literally. Um, but once you have the echo fusion capability, once the TE probe is uh, under fluoroscopy, so they just, the interventionist just has to hit fluoro once, it's registered. Once the probe is registered, you can get 2D, you can do markers. It's to build the heart model that you need that 10 seconds to do. But literally, it, it takes one fluoroscopy second to do echo fusion. I, I got to ask a challenging question because I got to challenge you a little bit here, Lucy, because yeah. you know how much I like you. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the case was great. So I, I've been seeing fusion for 15 years, yeah. Yeah. and it's still not everywhere. I mean, what, what's holding it back from being adopted more? You know, I, I think, and we love to see this in our lab, but we just don't have it. What's holding it back is the fact that, you know, in the early stages, what was required is that you need to have your cath lab uh, equipment match the echo lab, echo lab equipment. So we have a pure Philips lab, Philips fluoroscopy, Philips echo machine, and we have uh, the entire fluoro system um, set up. So uh, currently, I think they may be working on inner vendor um, matching, where you don't have to have all the same system. But I think that was probably one of the, the limitations to it. Um, but there's people that are investing in it, and it's helpful. I mean, especially as we become more and more um, advanced in our percutaneous procedures. Great. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Um, our next speaker will be Dr. Marvin Eng. who will be talking to us about balloon valve fracture for mitral valve and valve. All right. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me, and we'll get started. So... And uh, these are my disclosures. So our case is a 64-year-old woman who was hospitalized for acute decompensated heart failure, and she just kept getting hypotensive during dialysis, had short runs, didn't get fluid removed, and she takes, you know, midodrine during her dialysis runs just to keep her blood pressure up. And you can see she's got a complex surgical history with a prior repair that failed uh, very quickly, then went on to get a bioprosthetic replacement a month afterwards and then had a repeat bioprosthetic valve replacement uh, with a mosaic valve. That was the last valve that she had. And uh, she was no longer considered a surgical candidate by our surgeons. She had, you know, on dialysis and had a prior history of sudden cardiac death. And then her transthoracic echo, you know, showed that she had a mean gradient of uh, 13. Uh, she had a slight LVOT gradient, uh, possibly from, um, you know, mid-cavity obstruction, and uh, she had apparent pulmonary hypertension or right heart catheterization with a low cardiac output. So, you know, unfortunately she has a small bowel prosthetic valve, and, which is very challenging. So you can see the stent internal diameter um, is 22, or the true ID, I'm sorry, is 20.5, and this is a 25 uh, mosaic. Uh, so, you know, it just means you're using a small valve. And if you look at the data for using small valves, and this is from um, Brian Wisden's article published in JAMA, you know, the one year um, outcomes are attenuated, possibly from the high gradients you see, which is pretty reproducible across multiple, um, you know, registries. So, you know, we didn't want that outcome for her. Um, so what can you do? Oh, well, can you do like a high implant? Well. You can, and this is um, ex vivo data done on a benchtop model showing that, well, if you deploy the valve and it's, you know, you know, further away from the true annulus, maybe you can get lower gradients, but sometimes you, like, get this happening where, you know, your valve's just kind of floating in the ventricle. I'm sorry. Uh, can you just go back to that one and show that again? I'm sorry. And then... Um, 
Yeah, sometimes you get this. So, you know, you can, like my um, mentor once told me, you can only get so cute when you deploy things. Uh, so, you know, this is the new LVOT with the 23S3. It's kind of borderline. Um, you know, this is a porcine valve, so maybe LVOT obstruction is less of an issue because the leaflets don't get all the way to the posts. But if you wanted to put a bigger valve in, well, it gets, you know, even, you know, more risky. Um, so, you know, we just did an alcohol septal um, ablation and it was pretty marginal in terms of impact. Um, but, you know, it was a porcine valve, so we decided to go forward and we, you know, decided that we were going to fracture the annulus. So, um, it was actually not an easy case with all those surgeries. She had a very tough septum, had to do balloon assisted tracking uh, to get across her septum. And then, you know, here's our baseline gradient, you know, pretty significant. Um, transvalvular gradient uh, hemodynamic or invasively and uh, took a big cestostomy balloon. We was very concerned about delivery so it created uh, a counter traction rail by snaring a pigtail and putting the safari wire through the pigtail hanging on to that with a snare from the LV side and then um, you know I always like to do this little test to make sure with an inflated balloon you can get through and it seemed to still catch, uh, so we're a little worried about that. And then we dilated this um, 25 mosaic with a 26 Trudeau balloon, and you can see that uh, there's a pretty significant waste, and as we go up in atmospheres, we do take away some of that waste, but you can see that the balloon ruptures afterwards. So, uh, which is, so it's very important to clear all the air out. <laughs> um, I don't know, probably like 10, 12 ads. So, um, you know, delivering the sapien wasn't easy. Uh, we even used that little trick where, you know, we decided to unlock the valve and, you know, push it through. <laughs> um, eventually, we did get through, but if I had to do this again, I would use a buddy balloon and deploy the valve. Uh, so, you know, no valve embolization this time. And we still went ahead and post dilated with a 26 Trudeau uh, with the understanding that you know, it could rupture again, or um, we're not sure exactly what kind of impact we'll have. And then uh, this is our TE result, so no leak, leaflets look like they're functioning normally. And here's our hemodynamic impact. So uh, we were able to get to single digit to invasive gradients uh, afterwards. So I don't know how generalizable this is, because not every valve's the same, and you know, you know Anand's here, and he can tell us more about that. Um, and, you know, this is an epic valve that we did where we deployed the valve. It still kind of rec recoils a little bit afterwards when we release the balloon. So I'm not uh, sure if it's generalizable across all cases. But, you know, that's the trouble we have with small prostheses. They have high, you know, gradients, worse one-year survival. You know, we're extrapolating from the aortic experience. It's feasible, but we don't have a lot of generalizable safety data. So, you know, which ones fracture better, some bench data, uh, data would be useful. And, you know, we have to think about more about lifetime management strategies. And then are there going to be better platforms for valve and valve? This is just uh, the latest from Edwards. This is a, a Mitris Resilia valve. You know, will that be better than some other platforms that are being used? Maybe I'll just comment a little bit on the surgical valves. 25 is the smallest surgical valve we, use, we can use mitral valve. I will do everything I can to cram something not a 25 in now. And when I was younger and we didn't think about this, I, I would put in a 25 and not think twice about it. And I think that, that's becoming, we're noticing that that effective orifice is only 20, 21. And that's really a problem for us. What mosaic, mosaic is even, mosaic to me, the reason I don't use a mosaic is it's even worse. Right. So, you know, if I think I'm going to have a 25, I'll put a 25 magna in with the effective orifice here is a little bit better. And the only patients that I would do that in is a lady with a BSA of less than 1.5, and they're severely calcified because you can't do a root enlargement like you can in an aortic valve side. So we need to re, like we taught the surgeons not to put in 19 and 21 valves, we need to teach the surgeons not to put in 25 mitral valves. That's something we're going to have to spend some energy on. Marvin, two quick questions. Uh, first of all, how long do you wait when you do an alcohol septal ablation to re-measure your neo-LVOT? Was that your pre and post immediately? Do you wait four weeks, six weeks? 
We do somewhere between four and six weeks. It's challenging because, you know, the time delay, like the patients have been referred to you, and by the time you get to a structural team, it's already been like almost months sometimes since our initial presentation. So we go four to six weeks. I, I don't know what the magic number is. Yeah, because I mean, as you know, like there's that edema that it gets worse before it gets better. And the so question is, well, how long do you wait? But you're right, there's the logistics. Second question, have you ever considered, has anyone ever tried using an Anui balloon um, in some of these? You get bigger sizes, because it's not like calcium that's puncturing the balloon, right? It's the atmospheric limitations of the balloon. You take a big Anui, you've got two layers there. I always wonder if that, that's sometimes helpful when you've ruptured a true deal. Yeah, I, I mean, I have never tried. One of the issues is, anyways, the atmosphere uh, is lower. Yeah, it's tend to, it tends to be two to four, and so you just you just don't get the rate of force that you would out of a true. But uh, but do you think you fractured this valve then with that true balloon? Because it sounds like it it ruptured at twelve or fourteen. Yeah. And my understanding is, Adnan, you've done that work. I mean, doesn't this normally fracture at twenty to twenty four? Uh, yeah, I, th I think you fractured it. So, you, um, you know, first of all, the 26 balloon was way larger than the ID of the valve. You know, so um, if anything, compared to some of the bench work that has been done, probably you have a lower fracture threshold because you use such an oversized balloon. The thing about mosaic that's interesting is that um, it can be made out of one of two polymers that Medtronic uses. This is for the aortic position. I don't know about the mitral position, though. But um, so there's Delrin and there's Peak, and the two act differently. The one we tested fractured, you know, when we did our bench testing years ago. But um, it, it can fracture at like 8 to 10 atmospheres, or it can remodel if the other polymer is used. And then what will happen is that you, you, you will not see the needle of the inflator, you know, drop suddenly because it's not fracturing, but it will slowly stretch. Uh, it com and completely, you know, um, stretched, but you ha you've got to go to 20, 22 atmospheres to do that. And you don't know which mosaic valve you have, so you just kind of have to, you just have to go up on the pressure and see what happens. But, you, you know, you need the knowledge, that you know, was, to know what to expect. That was really comforting, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> really good. So, but dude, so, so question, so BVF before or after you put in the Sapien? So, you can see, yeah, we did both, right? So. I, I mean, I don't know. The patient was stable, even though, and we've done this a few times, even with pre-dilating uh, prior to. So it, it's not so it's not a stability issue. Uh, do I get better results? I, I'm not sure, uh, but I just feel like I think it, it makes me feel, I guess, more comfortable deploying the valve and actually having the valve expand. And then I find that I have to I to feel comfortable with the result, I have to post dilate to make sure it's fully expanded. I mean, I would have said before, I, I don't know what the bench testing I was, says. I was but thinking after. You think after? Well, I guess I worry about injuring the sapien after I put it in, uh, but I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, Paul, I was just gonna add, so yeah. I just had a case of a 25 mosaic. Um, the valve and valve app says to put a 23 sapien in, but to fracture it, you need a 26 balloon. We did that and the, the new sapien got injured afterwards. Yeah. Okay, last comment, Morris, and we're going to move on. Well, we, we did a case, and we did it afterwards, safe in breath, so the only chance is to put another safe in, and then you can use breath, and then your LVOT is up. Okay, so let's conclude before. <laughs> there you go. Two great anecdotes. A lot of anecdotes. I was going to say a lot of anecdotes. Yeah. Okay. What is that? All right. All right. Uh, thank you. That was yes. great. So last but not least, uh, our co-moderator, Suzanne Barron, is going to give a talk. Um, about tier that expands our boundaries. Thanks so much. A uh, little tough to uh, follow all of these cases, but I will, I will try. Um, these are my disclosures. So this is a case of an 88-year-old female. She's got a past medical history significant for severe AS. Yes, I know this is a mitral session, I promise. Uh, severe AS, uh, uh, six sinus syndrome, status post uh, uh, pacemaker, hypertension, AFib, carotid disease, chronic UTIs, and she presented to Valve Clinic for evaluation of aortic stenosis. She was symptomatic, had progressive dyspnea on exertion over the last six months. So on echocardiogram, uh, there's some selected images that I'm showing here. Um, you can see she's got some at least moderate concentric LVH with as well as some uh, septal prominence, a uh, heavily calcified aortic valve, and on closer view on the, on the right, you can see that she's got some pretty significant SAM. 
Her four chamber views, she's got some mild MR, she's got mild to moderate AR, uh, and you can see there's flow acceleration um, across the LVOT. Her mitral gradient was two. And uh, I love these pictures because when we did continuous wave Doppler through the LVOT, you can actually see that there's evidence of both the uh, early systolic aortic valve gradient uh, as well as that late systolic dagger-shaped outflow uh, tract gradient. And you can see there was actually uh, some dynamicness to the LVOT gradient uh, as shown on the right. She got a mean aortic valve gradient that was uh, estimated at 71 and her peak LVOT gradient, depending on when you measured it after which beat, uh, went as high as 136. So we took her to catheterization, and uh, in this poor shot that was done by my fellow, you can see that uh, her right coronary artery is flush occluded at the ostium. And then when we get to the left system, she's got some mild to moderate disease, uh, both in her circumflex as well as her LAD, but you can see she has some pretty extensive collateralization uh, coming from the left system, and particularly from those LAD septals uh, out to the RCA. So, uh, you know, in review of all this data, our team had some pretty significant concerns for um, a quote-unquote suicide left ventricle post-haver placement given her high LVOT gradients. And so we discussed her in multidisciplinary meeting and management options that we talked about were cardiac surgery for this frail 88-year-old woman, uh, TAVR followed by medical management of a residual LVOT gradient with uh, just kind of let's hope that nothing bad happens, uh, alcohol septal ablation uh, followed by TAVR several weeks later, but concern for that was going to be that we were going to compromise her collaterals to our RCA, uh, TIR to treat SAM, again off-label, followed by TAVR, and then palliative care. Um, and again, since this is a mitral uh, uh, session, you can guess what direction we chose to go. Uh, so we took her to the cath lab for a combined mitroclip and TAVR procedure. So shown here is her initial TEE image. Again, demonstrates just mild mitral regurgitation, but you can see the SAM pretty clearly as well as evidence of uh, uh, significant flow acceleration across the LVOT. Um, the mitral procedure itself was actually pretty standard, pretty stable because we didn't have any sort of bad pathology to deal with. Uh, her mitral clip we just advanced in the usual fashion. We're going for a simple A2P2. Um, and you can see here uh, that this is us grasped. And even as you can see on the right, you can see that the, uh, the SAM has greatly reduced. We then went ahead and uh, did her TAVR using a 23 millimeter sapien implant, deployed that right transfemoral, valve positioning was uh, confirmed to be adequate, and afterwards we could see we only had trace PVL that was on TTE. So this is her TTE immediately post-procedurally, and you know there is less SAM, but you can see that her LV is severely hyperdynamic um, and is actually kind of collapsing on itself. And this is in spite of the fact that we hydrated her pretty substantially before the procedure, particularly with the induction of anesthesia. We were concerned uh, that that was going to knock her, uh, knock her into an arrest. Um, so despite that, we still had this, and, uh, and here's what we had. We still had substantially elevated velocities across the LVOT. Now, obviously, her aortic valve gradient was better, uh, but she still has gradients up to, you know, four here through the LVOT. Postoperatively, she had some hypotension. Uh, initially, we gave her hydration. She was on some low-dose neosinephrine, and actually within 12 hours or so, she turned around. Um, she, was, she was discharged home on post-op day three. We increased her dose of beta blocker and, uh, to treat the residual LV cavitary gradient. And uh, nicely, uh, at one month follow-up, she was feeling a whole lot better. And at one year follow-up, she remains asymptomatic. Her aortic valve prosthesis is normal. Um, she does continue to have a residual moderate LVOT obstruction uh, with a peak of 52, but that's substantially declined from her peak of 134 pro uh, before. Um, and she feels good. So we called this a big old win. And uh, there's this, this guy, Paul Saraja, who, you know, had uh, published some papers about this. And so actually, there, there really hasn't been a lot that's been published about this. But we have seen sort of similar things in case reports and case series. So this was a case series of five patients who had hokum um, and uh, were actually symptomatic with hokum and having severe MR. And they were treated with successful tear. And you can see that everybody did well. Resting gradients went down. Mitral regurg went down. Um, and they functionally improved. But interestingly, similar to our patient, three out of the five patients had persistently elevated LVOT gradients on their follow-up echocardiogram. Um, and uh, luckily, one of those patients underwent simultaneous echocardiography and invasive hemodynamics, which demonstrated a lack of correlation. Um, and actually, you can see that the LVOT gradient was 64 versus 22 on catheterization. And so this was kind of thought that, you know, perhaps there's this persistent intracavitary grade LVOT gradients and you have a downstream pressure uh, recovery phenomenon that can result in overestimation of the echo-derived uh, specific LVOT gradients. 
But either way, TIER for the treatment of SAM, either in the management of HOCAM or in this case in conjunction with TAVR for the management of severely elevated LBOT gradients and AS can represent another way that TIER can be used for the treatment of our patients with complex valvular heart disease. Thanks so much. That's great. Suzanne. So we're about two minutes over, but I think we have time for one or two uh, questions. Paul, you have a question? No, I think, Suzanne, that's fantastic. Uh, and so I'm really glad to see that. I think one of the challenges is just what you showed is the peak LVOT gradient. And so uh, we did a few, and then we kept seeing these gradients afterwards. And then, so the last one I did, I did echo and cath, and the gradient wasn't there. And, uh, and Pradeep actually brought it up. We were sitting here. It's intracavitary, it's yeah. pressure recovery. And my mentor, Nish, at Mayo, I asked him, what, do you, what does he think about these? He said, Paul, there are 600,000 people in the United States with HCM. 450,000 of them have uh, obstruction, and there are not 450,000 uh, symptomatic patients uh, walking around. And that's because most people can live with the gradient just fine as long as they don't have MR. Yeah. And, so, and so, so don't treat just the gradient. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Excellent. Other questions from the audience? Well, Paul, I want to tell you that this session is just at, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sure everybody's going to give you a different answer here, and I'll tell you that if, depending on the day, I'll give you a different answer also. Um, we have not done many combined mitral and tricuspids. We've done some, but we generally prefer to avoid it. And the difficult question is deciding which procedure to do first. Um, so we try to be thoughtful about it. We try to determine what the main driver of the patient's symptoms are. But honestly, usually you end up in a situation where you have severe MR and you have severe um, AS. If it's functional, it's a very easy answer. Obviously, you're going to do the TAVR first every time. But if you have severe degenerative with a big flail, um, and it's really, I mean, torrential MR, and the AS is kind of mean gradient of 40 or sort of somewhere in the borderline range, I would clearly personally do the mitra clip first. Pretty. That's just my strategy. Pretty. what would you do? If it's, both, if it's both severe and severe and the MR is primary, we would still do TAVR. That's the easy one. Just get it out of the way and then um, definitely do a mitra clip later. Paul? Yeah, I, I think it's, if it's definitely going to be a sapien case uh, with the rapid pacing, I would actually tend to do the mitral clip first if it's primary. Uh, but if it's secondary, I always do the AS first. Yep. Raul? Yeah, I agree with Paul, but I, I never do them at this, almost never do them at the same procedure. Yeah, we don't do them at the same procedure, mainly for cost reasons. But um, in Boston, you don't have to worry about cost. That's okay. <laughs> Mark, any, any different? No, the same. So we gave you a very good, consistent answer. Nobody, uh, you know, there's about 50-50 in what we would do here. Sorry, I think you just have to, every patient is just very individualized care, I think, as far as that goes. Paul, I think that this has been absolutely a dynamite session. Let's uh, do it again in a half hour. Yeah. So congratulations, guys. Great job.